uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And all sorts of wonderful conversations in the coffee breaks. Um, let, let me just say that uh, in the last two weeks, I have had been misquoted more times than in my entire previous life. Uh, and if you want to be misquoted that much, there are several ways you can do it, but nothing beats being mentioned on the Daily Show. That, that created, and we had no idea this was coming. He picked up on it, and it created a flood unlike anything. Do you know that half the people in the United States get their news every day from the Daily Show? <laughs> anyway, where did he get it? Why did he pick up on it? Let me show you. It was an op-ed piece from the Wall Street Journal authored by me, which I said the case against global warming skepticism. There are good reasons for doubt until now. Actually, those weren't my words. Uh, that's what the Wall Street Journal put in. My title was Cooling the Warning Debate. How skeptics made lots of good points, we've addressed some of them, and there's still a lot of issues that need to be done. But I am now quoted because my name is underneath that first title. Anyway, just beware when you write an op-ed piece that things like that happen. I'm going to give you a backwards talk. So in, in some ways, there's nothing more boring than the details of how you construct a record from 39,000 uh, temperature sites and how you handle all the systematics. So I'm going to motivate you by giving you what I consider our most interesting results first. And then I'll quickly mention a few of, of, of the way we handle the most important systematics. The systematics that got me into this. So two years ago, I was someone who felt that the temperature record required additional detailed study, required looking at the systematics, uh, and we put together this team, uh, Elizabeth, uh, same last name as mine, not a coincidence, my daughter Elizabeth and I put together a project, we called it the Birth of the Earth Surface Temperature Project, um, and, uh, and, and started this work to try to redo uh, the surface temperature measurements, which we were convinced were the most critical thing that needed a careful reinvestigation. So I'll start with results. I'll talk about the data selection bias, homogenization bias, station quality, and heat island. Those are the four things we were most concerned about and we have now addressed. I'll show you the movie at the end. And then the next talk, Robert Brody, uh, who is really the powerhouse behind everything that we've done. Uh, he, 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 the, the problems of getting, the data are all public. The problem is they're in 15 different locations in almost that many different formats, and they're full of lots of things like minus 99s, and temperatures that are above boiling of water, and below absolute zero. So you, you, you have to go through this, and if you make any change, like subtract, getting rid of something that's below the one point of water, you should flag it so people know you have at that point touched the data. So Robert took on this task, and it was a Herculean task. And I call it the cleaning of the OG in the stables, but but he has done this, and as a result, the database, not all of it, so far only the yearly temperature data, are online. You can download them and you can work with this yourself now. What, what, what we're hoping to do is reduce the threshold for people who want to work with the surface temperature stuff. So that's an enormous task, uh, that, that, and, and he, he's going to be giving a talk following mine. So let's begin. Uh, this is the uh, statistical analysis of, of, we didn't get, we couldn't use all 39,000 stations. Some of them were just two short records, less than six months. But we were able to use 39,000 of the stations. Uh, the, NOAA had used, I believe, 19% uh, of the stations, we used 96%. This was to overcome any issue about whether station selection affects the answer. So by using all the stations available, nobody, they can accuse NOAA. NOAA can, can check their, do their stations in a completely unbiased way, but they will still be accused of, of having selected the data. So the, the cleanest answer is to use all the data. So we use all the data. This is the record. This shows the yearly average. Online, you'll also find the monthly average, and average over five years, and average over 10 years. So, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is our basic result. You notice we're able to go back to 1820. Uh, Robert will tell, tell you more about that. To do this, when you only have coverage over Europe and some of North America and maybe a little bit of India, how do you do that? Well, the answer is you test what you're doing by going to the modern record when you have very <coughs> complete coverage and you do the analysis using only those selected sites and you see how well you can do. As a result, you get these uncertainties, which are quite large. 
uh, based on that kind of spatial errors. There's statistical errors, there's no spatial errors, and Robert will tell you more about that. The errors get really tiny up here. We plot our, most of our graphs with these gray bars indicating the uncertainties. The uncertainties here are small enough that this cycle is real. And I was asked, after we put this online, do you really believe that? I do. Those are 95% confidence levels, and they are conservative confidence levels. Robert will tell you more about how you get those. Uh, but I believe we have done, an ex well, Robert has done, an extraordinary job at calculating our uncertainties on this using, using that as excellent methods. Um, okay. What are these bumps here? I mean, everybody knows these bumps. We did the following interesting test. We took a data set that's completely independent from one that has ever been used before by any other group. And then we analyze, we look at that to see if the bumps are the same they are. It simply indicates they're climatological, as you already know. But it's a nice test to do. But what are they? Uh, I'm going to show you that, th that these things are much more closely related to the AMO than they are to El Nino 3.4. And that's here. What we've done here is that there's the data, the data from four groups. Uh, from, from, from the three standard groups and now ours are put together. You see the correlation. This has been deep trended from 1950 to, to the present. We basically just deep trended so you can see to emphasize those fluctuations. On top of that, I have to turn off my cell phone so it's phony right now. <laughs> On top of that, we have plotted ENSO, the 3.4. And you can see there's a very good correlation. Most of those bumps are, in fact, fairly well correlated with ENSO. Uh, having done that, we then checked all the other uh, standard parameters, and to, to our astonishment, we found that the correlation with the AMO was much better. Uh, there are several ways you can do this. You can do a correlation analysis. I'll show that in a moment. Here, just having the RMS difference, and, and, and here the RMS difference is 0.75, whereas with the AMO is 1.14. But you can do these statistical things, but just look at the two. This is, this is like a fingerprint. This is saying AMO is really playing a major role. There's been so much attention to ENSO, maybe because we are doing only the land. And ENSO, of course, is in the ocean. And if you include the oceans, it may dominate. But when you look at the land, and I'll show you some reasons why we think this, this, this may be the case. Folks, uh, this is our correlation analysis with, with the key. The statistical significance of this is astronomical. I mean, if you can see it in the data, then, 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 of course, it's very strong. Uh, I typically use statistical significance when you can't see the data and the who think is really there. This is why we think uh, uh, AMO may be dominating. Here's, this is a correlation map, how much the temperature of various parts of the world is correlated. You can see the AMO is sweeping across. It has much more influence on the uh, northern hemisphere where the land is, and we're only doing land. Look at ENSO, it's much more dramatic but it's affecting most of the oceans. There's also an anti-correlation over here, which tends to cancel it, cancel it when you do the correlation analysis. So I, I think this is very interesting. And it, it, so many of the talks at this conference have indicated the increased importance of AMO. We're just adding to that. Uh, back to this plot. This is with the uh, yearly averages. And you can see uh, we're in very close agreement, more so than in our publications, which are online, because NASA got together with Robert and found why there was a difference. They were actually including in some of the oceans. So they're very close to here. Hadley proves a little bit different there. Hadley is also a little bit different here, outside of our 95% confidence limits. We're very confident about this. It is dropping, and it is oscillating. Where are those oscillations? Peter Charlock contacted me and said, that looks like a 20-year cycle that, that we, we reported. And here's Charlock's data. Sorry for the poor graph. But this is oxygen-18 measurements from Greenland, averaged, detrended, and it filtered with an 11-year running filter. But look at that peak, that peak, that peak, that peak, and now a little bit of garbage. But over this much, the correlation is striking. Uh, and if he had asked me whether we really believe in these cycles, and I said, yes, because Robert's work is so well done. And we had Robert did this work. We had a team of about eight people that looked over it in great detail. But he did most of the creative work. And the conclusion that, that I reach is this cycle is real. Now, this was detrended. Uh, we show it dipping down. Oh, uh, that's a spectrum of our data. And it shows the 24 child X cycle, 24 <coughs> years. Here, the large AMO, which is typically 65 years, 
When we do the spectral analysis on these 210 years worth of data, we get a peak at 72. Uh, kind of curiously, uh, this is the third harmonic of that. I may or may not be uh, relevant. The dip is real. And for comparison, I'll make sure I'm time to move it. For comparison, uh, this yellow line here shows that line superimposed on the two famous hockey sticks. Uh, this dip is in serious disagreement with the hockey sticks. Actually, it doesn't disagree very much with the IPCC report of, of 1995. Like I got cut off with what's going on there, uh, which shows it cooling way back then. But the more modern ones don't, and that's slow. Uh, it's an interesting disagreement with the famous hockey sticks. And we stand by this. We really believe we have measured that. Well, it could be overly influenced by the northern hemisphere, and we're aware of that. And I think it, it requires a lot more scrutiny. Oh, this is just a curious thing. Uh, and and uh, yesterday, uh, I was talking to Ross Salovich, and, and he asked me, uh, this dip, is this tambora? I mean, uh, you can look at this plot here. You say, oh, that's Tambora. But wait a minute. It was anticipating it's Tambora. But that's what it's for. Well, this is a 10 year running average. 10 year running averages do anticipate. So let's look at the yearly stuff. And it turns out the coldest year on record, according to ours, was six years before Tambora. Now, there was some pre eruptions, and maybe that's what we're seeing. But I think this adds more content to this discussion that I've heard here about what is the role of the aerosols. How much of, of the volcanic eruptions do they really contribute? I think this can't be simply dismissed. It has to be looked at and considered in. Uh, oh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we verify the leveling off of the temperature. Our data, if you draw, if, if, if you can draw a flat line there and say we've leveled off. You draw a flat line there and say it leveled off in 1980. Uh, if you want to play that game, you can do that. Uh, you can also draw an envelope there, an envelope there, and say no evidence. Our statement is simply these data don't add any evidence for or against the leveling off of the temperature of the last 13 years. Okay, this is the United States. And what I've done is taken every station in the United States that has a 100 year record and indicated whether over the last 100 years, it has cooled or warmed. So the blue ones are the stations that have cooled. When I do talks around the country, I check, and I, I'll print out the, the local record. You know, a third of the time when I go someplace, it turns out they've cooled. It's always amusing because everybody thinks they can sense global warming. Global warming is present in this. If you calculate, it's a ratio, there are twice as many red spots as blue. And, and if you take that ratio and you calculate the average, if you just do the plain average, let me show you what you get. Here's a histogram. This is not the distribution for the United States. This is the distribution for the world. We have 13,000 stations in the world that have cooled. 13,000. And 26,000 that have warmed. And the, there's the zero. And you can see the fact that it's above zero, if you calculate the mean of that, you get about the one degree temperature rise that we've seen. So if you do not detect global warming locally, most of you already know this, this puts it in a rather dramatic way. Uh, we find lots of surprises in the data. Uh, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> oh, PowerPoint screws us again. Uh, these are stations in Japan. And it turned out when we looked at Japan and we were curious which were the stations that were cooling, and these are the stations that were cooling, they all turned out to be airports. The ones that cooled the most were airports. We don't understand that there's somebody's PhD thesis in there. <laughs> Coverage, the red spots are the spots that Robert added in that weren't previously new. You see there, everybody remember. And, and this is oh, the, the monthly data, Robert will talk more about this, the GHCN monthly data <laughs> dropped the number of stations. Uh, not for any stinky reason, Robert can tell you about that. The number of stations we use uh, stays up very high, 36,000 altogether. This is Anthony Watson station, following the stations are in terrible shape. I'm getting near the end of my time, so I'm going to go quickly. I knew I'd have to do this, but um, <laughs> we'll be around and we will talk. And our papers are online. This simply shows the, the temperature calculated with the good stations and the poor stations. And they're virtually identical to the differences over here. There's no significant upward slope to that. An upward slope would indicate that the poor station quality was affecting the answer. So uh, 
we, we, the station quality doesn't affect the changes. We, for, for his different station classes, we do the histograms, and there's no significant difference between any of those. We've done this many different ways our papers online. Uh, urban and rural, this is the world using the MODIS satellite uh, network of what's urban and rural. And uh, we, 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 we calculate the temperature based only on very rural sites. These are sites that are far from anything that is, uh, that, that is urban. And we find no difference between that and the average. So uh, let me now show our movie. So this is Robert, this is, this is Robert, here's the, here's the temperature record. And yearly, and but now this is a map. At 1800, you see we don't have much coverage. Uh, this is based on the, on the known correlation of publishing between temperature and coverage. This is the area that we cover, actually in India, that thanks to the British. And, uh, and, and you'll watch this evolve over time, and I think you'll find this wonderful. So, start up, will we? 1802, 1803, 1804, look at the flashing. Look at the anti-correlations. Um, look at the coverage, which isn't very good, 1815. But that pulsing that we're seeing there, uh, sometimes it's really hot, and then it gets really cold, and then really hot, and then really cold. There are these pulsations. Uh, many of them are, I believe, associated with the AMO based on our other analysis. 1840, we're getting much better coverage of the Northern Hemisphere. We get a little bit of Australia in there. When we get to 1933, you will see the dust flow. Uh, you'll see that over here. Uh, so I try to find this a little work with help right, with my uh, remaining time. But uh, 1865, uh, we're getting very good coverage now. And uh, no Antarctica, of course, that doesn't come in until the 1950s. Um, just, oh, over here, we have the average temperature, average over the whole world, not average, well, the average over the whole world, based on, uh, on, on this group. Those are really warm, warm period. Well, you see them here. There was, there's the warm period. There was Tambora, but, but, but anticipated by the climate. Uh, cold, warm. These hot spots are, the, the public just doesn't understand. These, these little microclimate things, uh, you know, my best guess from what I've heard at this meeting and from my own analysis is that we're looking at variations in the ocean, and our next year is going to be spent trying to do a similar job on the ocean data. I don't know whether we'll do as well or whether we can, but we'll, but we'll come away with as much confidence. Oh, I missed my, I missed dust bowl. Forgot to mention it. Maybe some of you are looking over there. It was a big spot like that that just lasted for a few years. And it was localized. It wasn't all over the world. So now that we have these data, I mean, you can come to me and say, well, what about my hometown? And I can plot out this data at that point. We'll put this online soon. We have the fundamental temperature data online. We don't have the detailed data for this online, although this plot is available online. And now we're getting up here now. The two, this is pretty red. The color, of course, is chosen, so one degree. And here we are, an interesting fluctuation. This is 2009. We're updating the data to get a little bit of 2011. Uh, but interestingly, 2009 is when the Russian scientists said, hey, you didn't include Siberia. And it turns out there was a downward fluctuation that year. And indeed, it was very cold in Siberia. And indeed, they haven't included, not included those data. Well, we include those data. We include all of that stuff. We get the same answer fundamentally as Hadley Crew, as, well, actually, as, as NASA and as NOAA. And we're fairly close to having proof. So let me end right there. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, but we look at that. And, and, and what does it look at 89? See what the coverage is. That's all we have. Now, based on this, the fact that this was the lowest temperature and not 1815, no, that's not within the statistics. All we're saying is that within the statistics, it was pretty cold uh, in, 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 in 1809. And that, that, we, that we do have. But whether it was colder or not, we don't have that kind of uncertainty. And it's based on just that coverage. On the other hand, the uncertainties were determined by seeing how well we can occur coverage in the modern day. So I, I, I think it's a good uncertainty. Howie Epstein, University of Virginia. I, I just read uh, a few days ago the analysis that you did on rural versus urban. Yeah. And uh, what I gathered was that uh, that the rural, it, it seemed like from the analysis, the rural sites had actually warmed to a greater extent than the, uh, the urban sites, but that's not what you said. I was wondering if you could comment. Yes. Uh, on the paper we have online, the paper we submitted, uh, we did the analysis using our most advanced program. Uh, and we found that, in fact, the urban sites had a small, but we don't consider statistically significant, a warming compared to the rural sites. I'm sorry, the rural sites had, had a little bit more warming than the other. We never considered that statistically significant. Robert has subsequently improved the program by taking into account the fact that certain regions of the Earth have natural large fluctuations. Those should not have large uncertainties associated with them if the surrounding stations have similar large fluctuations. So this is what he calls the local mode. When we do that, we get a more precise record. The plot I showed you is an updated one using the more advanced statistics. In your, um, in your data, when you show, you show the 20 year oscillation in the, the 19th century, I see if that that oscillation stops in the 20th century. If we don't have it, why does it stop? The easy answer to that, I don't know. <laughs> uh, do you have any suggestions? I mean, when I do the Fourier analysis, I'm trying to find the best plot for that. And uh, I'm just getting a little bit confused here. Uh, <coughs> I want to show well, the best plot is actually, actually this one here. Uh, when I do the core analysis, it turns out that most of the 72-year uh, cycle comes from this realm. Right. And most of the 24-year cycle comes from this, this realm over here. Uh, but I haven't done yet, I, I, you know, I actually did this two days ago, is, is to look carefully to see how much of the 24 is here and how much of the 72 is there. But I think, I think it's an observation that there does seem to be a change at that point. Now, you, you might say, oh, we've changed the place and suddenly we've got a lot more stations available. And therefore, maybe this is much more accurate than that. Well, it is much more accurate than the error uncertainties. But I, I think you have to have some, some worry about this because there were a few stations, there was in the Northern Hemisphere, and although we calculate our errors, Robert will tell you more about that, it is exquisite care. It doesn't mean that we're not being unduly biased by the, by the data. Maybe you can split your data from the two centuries and do the full year analysis separate. Oh yeah, well, I, right. I, but I know, I, I mean, I, I know this is what's really contributing. When, when, when you detrend it and look at it, you see, you see that this is the 72 year period and that's the, that's the 24. If you see that. By the way, this does not match the sun cycles, sunspot cycles. I did look at that. It's very similar, 22 years, 24 years, but it gets out of phase about over here. There's enough of a difference if you superimpose the sun cycles so right about here to start getting. Well, this is less significant than that, so maybe it is a sunspot size, but it's not, it's not too important. Yes. 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 My question is, if you limit the analysis, I mean, no. that was good. Uh, if you limit the analysis uh, only to the stations that existed in the uh, 1800s, uh, would you get this uh, cycle always all the way to the 20th century? Uh, that's worth doing. Uh, you, the main thing that will happen to the error bar is that big over here. Um, I, I mean, they're asking whether we artificially generate it because we are looking at the northern hemisphere. And, 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 and we'll this that. particular that's a, that's a good a, a geographic area yeah. would still yeah. be oscillating yeah. in that yeah. well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. We'll do that. um, I don't know if you noticed in my talk, uh, but um, I did show some oh, of the problems. Oh, Peter Webster. 
uh, you might have noticed in my talk that uh, the, the inhomogeneity, the sea surface temperature data is far, 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 far greater. It makes your 1800 in the United States look pretty good. Um, so, so I think in a sense, with due respect, you've done the easy problem first. Uh, of course we did the easy problem first. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I'm not accusing you of being stupid, but, uh, uh, but I do ask if, uh, uh, how you would intend to take into account the inhomogeneity of the sea surface temperature coax data given that you're going to do that problem next. I'm going to leave that question for Robert, and I don't know whether you want to answer it now, Robert, or, or wait till your talk. But why don't you say a few words about this? Well? Uh, I, there you go. So uh, I think we need to hold off on answering that question, because I don't think we, we need to look at how we develop it and get a better feel for the inhomogeneities before we're prepared to give an answer to how we'll handle them. I mean, I certainly know they're there, but I'm not prepared to tell you what we'll do about them. You'll see when he talks about what we did on the land that there were a lot of subtleties that we encountered along the way that required a careful and defensible approaches. Uh, but uh, you can't always anticipate everything until you're getting into it. Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm Ryan Tinsley, and uh, I'll be talking about solar effects later on this afternoon. Uh, although the 24 year cycle isn't the same as the solar 22 year cycle. Um, one important thing is that that period from 1800 to 1820 is called the Dalton minimum of solar activity. And it was the deepest minimum, uh, multi-year minimum in solar activity since the Maunder minimum, which was also an extremely cold period in, in Europe, actually. We're talking about regional climate change. And you love your data came from Northern Europe and some from the United States. But, um, but for regional climate change, it's what I'll be talking about is that you do get quite strong solar effects. Yeah, it's interesting that your solar effects might be even stronger during the minimum. That, that is some interest in physics. Yes, that's certainly possible. All right, we'll move on to the next talk.